Okay, good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here so bright and early on a pretty fall day here in Washington. Uh, we are very pleased to have today's discussion uh, of hydrogen and green shipping, zero emission fuel in the maritime sector. I'm actually particularly uh, interested in learning a lot about this topic uh, today from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, before I get started, I'm Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Uh, and we are uh, really pleased to have all of you here. I have to do my security warning, uh, which is a security brief that we do before every event here, uh, which is in the event of some sort of uh, alarm or incident, uh, please uh, myself and some of my colleagues standing in the back uh, will be your security advisors and we'll tell you how to exit the building, but it's pretty evident from this room, you sort of go back out there, go down the stairs, or you exit this way and there'll be some uh, emergency exit directions and, and we'll uh, direct you from there. We don't anticipate that happening, uh, but just want uh, you to know that we take your security very seriously. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be working with the Norwegian Embassy and bringing this event uh, to you today um, because I think it's really, really timely. And I'm, I'm not going to go into that uh, for too many reasons because I'm going to leave that to my colleague, Adam Cohen. But I don't actually know a huge amount about the topic. And so we had to bring in reinforcements. Adam Cohen is the former Undersecretary uh, for Science at DOE, an affiliate here at uh, CSIS, and knows uh, lots more about this than I do. So he's going to be moderating our expert panel and discussion. Uh, but I'm really pleased uh, for a couple of reasons. One, as many of you know, I used to work for a Norwegian company, uh, so I have a soft spot in my heart for all things uh, Norwegian. Uh, and secondly, I'm from New England, and there's a New Englander on the panel. Uh, so this marries two things that I like uh, very much in addition to energy and science. Uh, without further ado, I am really pleased to have uh, the Norwegian ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Oss is no uh, uh, stranger to those of us here at CSIS. But he was so excited about this project, he wanted to come off and kick, uh, kick off this session personally. So we're very pleased to have you here to make some remarks this morning, Mr. Ambassador. Please join me. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you all here today. A big thank to Sarah, Adam, and the CSIS team for organizing this interesting and timely event with us. And as Sarah said that uh, CSIS and Norway go a long time back, and I must say that I'm very, very pleased that with the partnership we have and the cooperation we have on several areas. So to on today's topic, uh, the ocean has always been the backbone of the Norwegian economy. In fact, our coastline is even longer than the US coastline. Over the last 40 years, a significant part of Norway's wealth has come from offshore oil and gas exploration and production. But long before the oil and gas era, we had ships and fish, and Norway will still always have ships and fish, no doubt about that. Our greatest challenge these days is to avoid dangerous climate change. The Norwegian government has a strategy called green competitiveness. The aim is to reduce emissions while creating jobs and growth. Norway also has an ocean strategy where our aim is to take the blue economy to the next level. Green shipping is a key part of all that. Green shipping is particularly important for three reasons. First, ships have a long life cycle. A ship engaged in international trade normally operates for 25 years before it is recycled. In other words, Norway is thinking long term. We are already developing and launching low carbon emitting, ship, emitting ships in order to meet the low carbon goals of 2050. By which time, Norway will cut its CO2 emissions by 80 to 95%. Second, green shipping offers climate friendly solutions. In fact, Norway plans to transport more goods by sea than by roads. The green shift will not only have, envi will not only have environmental benefits. We expect it to contribute to higher value creation and a competitive advantage for the industry. Thirdly, the shipping sector is one of the areas where Norwegian solutions can make a global difference. We build on centuries of tradition and knowledge combined with advanced technologies. This past summer, a declaration of intent to cooperate on climate change was signed between the state of California and Norway 
zero emission transportation was an area of priority. I am glad to see that this joint effort, effort is already bearing fruit. Companies on the west coast of Norway and Sandia National Laboratories in California are already in discussions and they want to participate in a broader cooperation between Norway and California. We are very pleased to see that the Norwegian and Californian researchers, local governments and industry find common ground in developing climate solutions for maritime transport. They are doing great work on hydrogen as a zero emission fuel. It is my hope and belief that working together across the Atlantic, we can bring along new groundbreaking solutions that will lead the way to a low carbon economy. This will be good for both the industry and the environment, and we will create tomorrow's jobs. I look forward to interesting and relevant presentations and discussions here today. Our conversation today will give us important insights into how we can promote further cooperation between research, government and industry in moving green solutions forward. Thank you again for attending today's discussion. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so as Sarah said, I am Adam Cohn. I'm going to be moderating this event. And let me just introduce myself real briefly. So I am currently the president and CEO of an organization called AUI. AUI is a managing organization and we run R&D laboratories and facilities, you know, much like the contractors that run Sandy and our other national laboratories. So that's what I do now. And previously, I was the deputy undersecretary for science and energy at the Department of Energy. So I have good familiarity, and I have to admit that I'm somewhat of a closet fan of hydrogen as a solution. Uh, some of the areas that I think we're going to have real difficulty turning into clean areas would be transportation as one and industrial processing as another. Uh, and there are certain parts of the transportation mm -hmm. sector that can really only be explored as clean in using things like hydrogen. It's not clear how, for example, mm -hmm. you're going to get a battery to run an airplane or a battery to run a ship. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but it's much clearer, at least in my mind, to look at how you could imagine hydrogen serving this. And so that brings us to this panel. It's extremely interesting to explore this idea, and it's great to see all of the activities that are being pursued, because I really think hydrogen is a, a game changer, and we need to pursue it with a lot of vim and vigor, if you will. So with that, I'm going to introduce the panel, and then each of the panel members is going to take a few minutes, 10-ish you know, minutes, to give a talk and give their perspectives on this topic, and then we're going to have a couple of discussions in terms of a panel discussion, and then I'll open it up to Q&A. And certainly, if there are any burning questions, you know, please uh, either whisper it, write it down, or, you know, or make sure I can see you so I will call on you at an appropriate time. So with that, let me introduce the panel members. To, the far, to my far right, or far left, is Elizabeth Bow. She is the project manager for Hydrogen Region, Son and Fjordain. And she will talk a little bit about their activities with regard to what they're doing in terms of production mm -hmm. and use and growing the economy from a hydrogen perspective. Uh, next, next to me is Joe Pratt, who is a principal member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratory. And we'll talk about the R&D that they are pursuing. And then Lars Gimestad, his, he has just recently joined the Brodrain Og Company. I apologize if I <laughs> mispronounce it. You know, my Norwegian pronunciation is not as good as it should be. Uh, but he is the deputy CEO, and he can give uh, his perspective on what the company is doing in terms of production of the fleet and the types of, of storage technologies that are going to be needed. And then Martin Grimness is the president of Arcadia Alliance which is a newly created joint venture company focused on introducing and marketing environmentally friendly carbon fiber tanks and vessels. So with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to come here, um, and I would also like to thank the Royal Norwegian Embassy and the CSIS for organizing this event. Um, I'm going to talk to you about an initiative uh, in Sognefjordane, uh, a region on the west coast of Norway. Um, 
in a way, you can say that this is a direct response, a practical and very hands-on approach to uh, the government policy when it comes to energy transition, when it comes to tackling climate change, and when it comes to green competitiveness. Um, hydrogen region of Songno Fiorana uh, has a purpose. Um, we are going to create basically a living lab for local hydrogen value chains in Songno Fiorana. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about what we put into that um, um, concept with uh, the local value chains and the, the living lab. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the region first. Um, as you can see, we're located on the west coast of Norway, and this is our backyard. We have um, a harsh coastline with lots of, of storms and wind. We have high mountains. Uh, the water is coming down those mountains and creates very good opportunities for us to produce hydropower. So we are mostly um, hydropower based, uh, but also some wind. So, and the ge geography can be challenging. Um, some of the most remote areas in Norway are in Sognefjordana, and it's sparsely populated. So, but uh, this makes up for a, a, actually a very good place to have uh, hydrogen value chains because in order to produce clean hydrogen, you need a lot of electricity and you need a lot of water. So you split the water and your product would be hydrogen, oxygen, and heat. So, and this can be used as fuel, for example, within the maritime sector, can be used uh, within the industry to make it cleaner and greener, and can be used as energy storage so that you're not dependent on the grid for example. So being a living lab for these kinds of technologies, um, basically we have a history with that. Um, in Norway, we uh, uh, initiated quite a lot of the development when it comes to liquid natural gas. Uh, we also uh, are on um, a good way of, uh, of electrifying uh, the ferry sector, for example. Um, the first uh, fully electric car ferry was made uh, in Norway a couple of years ago, and we see basically a revolution now with 50 more ferries to come within 2020, and 50 out of 130 ferries in Norway would be electric by uh, 2020. Um, so all this is helped by public pr procurement, basically. Um, so Norway has a good tradition with that. So, um, basically, just to sum up why uh, we are working with hydrogen, we have lots of renewable energy in our region. Most of that, or at least a good share of that, is uh, either exported through the grid or it's trapped inside bottlenecks in the regional grid. And uh, following up on the government strategy with more local use of that renewable energy, uh, hydrogen production and local use of that hydrogen is one of the solutions. So, um, the surplus energy uh, will be used into a new energy systems thinking. Um, it can save us costs by producing uh, hydrogen and use it, uh, for example, where the grid doesn't go, or if the, uh, the grid connection is poor or the capacity uh, is not good. Um, when it comes to local value chains, we have the perspective that this is going to create new local jobs uh, within the traditional industries, but also uh, it will help us build up a competence within, within the green economy of the future. So um, I'll explain more about the local value chains later but also the climate, uh, tackling climate change part of it is important to us. Um, we do have a big maritime sector also within the public transport sector. Um, if we take the 
I think it's 12 high-speed passenger vessels that we have in operation in our county. If we would put all of those on zero emission technology, we would actually cut 55% of our CO2 emissions from the public transport sector in Sonofiorana. So we do a lot of commuting on the water and it makes sense to us to work with this first. Um, but the Living Lab is more than just technology. It's more than, it's more than the nature that we have and the natural resources. It's also working with education, the R&D sector, uh, businesses, uh, and also the international collaboration that we have with different partners is what makes up the Living Lab for hydrogen value chains in our region. So, um, how could a local value chain, uh, hydrogen value chain, look like? Um, the important thing to emphasize here, I think, is that this is a, a pretty immature value chain yet. In Song of Yurana, we haven't deployed any of this technology yet. We have a lot of promising prospects, and we think that this can be uh, something that could create jobs in the future, but uh, we need to do something to accelerate this, to make it happen. So uh, we are trying to stimulate the market through different end users. Uh, working with different end users of hydrogen makes sense because we have the power, the electricity, uh, and we have the water. So we need someone to can, uh, who can produce the hydrogen and make it uh, useful in different sectors. And we're looking for crossover effects. For example, when you look at the fish farming industry, a lot of the critics uh, against hydrogen is that it's not as energy efficient as using batteries. So it makes sense to use batteries wherever you can. If you can't use batteries, either because it's too heavy or it's too energy demanding operation, for example, when, with high-speed passenger vessels, you can use hydrogen. Um, so, uh, to be able to take back some of the energy loss, we are looking into using oxygen and heat, which is a, a byproduct from the hydrogen production process, uh, into fish farms, because the fish farms need uh, oxygen in their water and a stable temperature to make the fish eat more and grow bigger. So this is a this is a, an, an isolated business opportunity, but when we, you see it in connection with the hydrogen value chain, it makes sense from a business perspective. So we're working with these kinds of crossover effects. Um, and my job is basically to connect the dots and try to make all these businesses in Song of Yorana. Don't worry about the logos. It's, it might be confusing. Uh, but my, my job is to connect the dots and create the bigger picture. So this can be the living lab that we want it to be if these people manage to cooperate. So uh, one of the main objectives of the project is to create business opportunities for local businesses. So uh, we have set aside some funds with a county municipality uh, where we basically support local businesses working together to um, be able to realize some of the potential within the hydrogen value chains. So this is, for now, the portfolio that we have. We have four more projects uh, in the pipeline. Uh, I mentioned the fish farming industry. That's a very, very important focus area for us, but also the microgrids. Um, if we can save some of the costs with upgrading the grid or building new grid lines by producing and storing and distributing hydrogen instead, that will be very cost efficient when it comes to a society perspective on it. And the ports are important to us. So I think that the coastline and the ports, the harbors in Sogno Fiorana will be more or less a hub for everything else going on in our county when it comes to hydrogen. So I'm going to talk about a bit about our flagship project. This is something that we are very proud of. Uh, this vessel, uh, hopefully, it's been developed and designed by Brother Um 
and we hope to, to be able to finance and build it and that it's operative within 2021. Um, it's funded by the County Municipality and Innovation Norway. And it's part of the NVGL uh, Green Shipping Program in Norway. Uh, I believe you have an initiative going on in the States as well on trying to, to make this happen here. The Maritime Association of Song of Hjordane is project manager for this, this vessel. And the consortia is made out of, of really strong business partners. Um, and I think also the main reason why we are here is that we have a strong collaboration uh, with Sandia National Laboratories and our uh, sister project, the SF Freeze in San Francisco. So as you can see, the hydrogen tanks are on top there, uh, and that's for safety reasons. So uh, if we have a le leakage, the hydrogen will go up through the air and the risk will be reduced. So um, I have a folder with some information about this ship and there are uh, there is contact information there uh, for me and for Lars and also for the project manager for this specific vessel. So that was it for me. Thank you. Joe. Yeah. Uh, let's see this way. Okay, there we go. Great. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you, Karina and Paul at the Norwegian Embassy for organizing this event, um, and thank you, CIS, for hosting it. Um, so let's see, uh, just quickly before I get into the presentation, Sandia National Laboratories, for those who don't know, is one of the United States' three national security labs uh, we're within the Department of Energy. Uh, our job really is to provide accurate and unbiased technical expertise uh, for the nation um, in, in the interest of national security. In this case, uh, we're talking about energy and climate security. Uh, my colleague Lenny Klebanoff there in the back and I both lead the uh, zero emission maritime program at Sandia, which was started about five years ago. Um, so today I'm going to present uh, very briefly some of the things we've learned over, those, over that time in uh, uh, green maritime and also some thoughts about uh, U.S. Norway, Norway collaboration going forward. Uh, before I get into that, I want to briefly introduce hydrogen and fuel cells because many people like to say, oh yeah, I already know about that, but we've found that um, uh, many people don't. So just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, what is hydrogen? What is a fuel cell? This will be very brief. Um, hydrogen, you can think of it as very similar to natural gas. In the United States, many of us have natural gas in our homes. Hydrogen is a fuel. Uh, very much like that. The properties of how it behaves, how it burns, and things like that are very similar. Um, you can look at the natural gas molecule there. It's actually 80% hydrogen, so it kind of makes sense that these two things are very similar. There is one important difference, and that's that other 20%, which in um, natural gas, mostly methane there, is carbon. So when you use methane, you get not only water um, from, that's where the hydrogen goes, turns into water. You also get carbon monoxide um, and carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Hydrogen, on the other hand, when you use it, you get not only energy, but uh, water, and that's it. Uh, hydrogen by itself is not a toxic gas. Um, it's not a greenhouse gas. And if you spill it, for example, liquid hydrogen, uh, while you're fueling your boat and you have a leak and it spills into the water, uh, it's going to immediately evaporate, go up at about 45 miles an hour, uh, straight up into the sky. It's so light, it actually escapes <coughs> the Earth's atmosphere and leaks into space. So it's the only potential maritime fuel that will completely remove itself from the ecological environment in case it's spilled. So that's a little bit about hydrogen. Hopefully that helps. Um, 
fuel cells, there's a picture of a, a fuel cell from one manufacturer. There's many manufacturers in the world that produce fuel cells. They all look kind of the same. It looks like a computer rack, a server rack. That's pretty much what it is. It's a piece of electronics. It takes uh, hydrogen and air in. It doesn't combine them, but it just reacts them in a similar way as batteries uh, react chemicals, and it makes electricity um, and water. There are some pictures there of fuel cell cars. So that the picture on the top is a stationary power system for backup power. Uh, the pictures on the bottom are, are cars that are commercially available today from uh, three major manufacturers. There's fuel cell buses. So hydrogen fuel cells, these things are out there today. They're being used um, all the time. It's commercially available technology. Why are we thinking about hydrogen and fuel cells in the maritime industry? Why are we talking about zero emissions? Um, here's a couple charts from IMO greenhouse gas study done in 2014. The chart on the left shows the worldwide shipping trend uh, from the past uh, 30 or 40 years and then the expected increases just due to uh, industrialization of the world. Uh, you can see that it's a quite sharp increase in shipping, maritime shipping needed. On the, there's a corresponding increase in emissions that's associated with that, and that's the chart on the right there. Um, you know, what, what do these numbers mean? Uh, it's hard to quantify or hard to get a feel for millions of tons of carbon dioxide. You know, what is that? Just to put a little bit of context around it, um, 1,700 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is um, the chart on the right about halfway up. That's roughly the amount that comes out of all the United States uh, power plants in a year. Or it's roughly the amount that comes out of all the cars in the United States uh, in a year, somewhere around there. So that puts it a little bit of context. According to this chart, if we do this business as usual scenario in the maritime industry, we'll get to that uh, in about 20, 2035, 2040. Business as usual, I think, is an interesting term, um, and I want to explore that a little bit. Before I do, I want to read this quote from a report to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. It says, there is evidence that the greatly increasing use of fossil fuels is seriously contaminating the Earth's atmosphere with CO2. It is possible that this is already producing a secular climactic change in the direction of higher average temperatures. This could have profound effects both on the weather and on the ecological balances. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, I've heard that before. What? Tell me something new. Okay, so when did you hear that? When did you first hear about that? This report that I'm quoting was written in 1962. What have we done since then? That was over 50 years ago. That's business as usual. That's what they mean by that. We haven't done much. And if we continue to not do much, then we're going to be on that business as usual path. I look at that little red arrow that says you are here, and I see a fork in the road coming up. We can stay on the business as usual path, or we can choose the low one there, the efficiency improvements in use of non-fossil fuels. I think this is something that every nation, every city, every company, every person, each one of you can look at and make a choice. Which path do you want to take going forward? It's hard to do hydrogen and fuel cells in marine. Those are big ships. That's what I hear. You can't do that. That's crazy. It's got to be uh, fuel oil, diesel, etc. We just completed a study, uh, it should be on our website next week, you can download it. It shows that all of these vessels on this page can be powered by hydrogen fuel cells, many of them also by batteries. Um, from small fishing boats to the largest container ships in the world. How can that be? Uh, these require lots of power, lots of energy to get across the ocean. Well, conveniently, there's a trend in the shipping industry that the more power and the longer the voyage, actually the bigger the ship. So it gives you more room to put on the hydrogen and fuel cells. And I'm not talking about changing that entire ship over uh, and, and getting rid of all the containers or something like that. I'm talking about fitting these components 
in the existing envelope of weight and volume of the current engine room and fuel tanks without changing anything else on the ship. Um, we also have done a few more detailed studies, so that was a pretty high-level study. Um, Elizabeth mentioned the SF Breeze. This was a study Lenny and I completed last year. Uh, really a deep dive into could you do a high-speed uh, passenger ferry, 35 knots, 150 passengers, run it only on hydrogen fuel cells? Uh, the answer turned out to be yes, you can. It would float. Um, I see some Coast Guard folks in here. We work with them very closely to ensure that it would be acceptable from a regulatory point of view. We examined the economics of it, um, and we showed uh, not only that it's possible, but exactly how to do it, working with the naval architect and drawings, um, things like that. Zero emissions, uh, zero fuel spills, low noise, no fumes, no diesel odor, and uh, the throttle response actually would be quicker than than diesel. Um, Lenny just completed another study, a deep dive into a larger vessel, this time an ocean-going boat, 2,400-mile uh, range of 15 days. This, in this particular case, uh, it's a research vessel uh, designed to accommodate the uh, requirements of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California. Um, but the idea here is showing, again, that you've got uh, different types of boats. This is not just for small uh, coastal boats. You can do this on, on long-range vessels as well. And here you, you're actually getting some benefits for the science community. Uh, low noise, no airborne emissions, no soot, which is important if you're going to the Arctic, uh, and no possibility of fuel spills. So that's a brief overview of what we've done so far and, and where can we go. I think it's um, a fantastic idea to have a collaboration between the U.S. and Norway uh, because we're all working towards the same goals. Uh, some of these things I've shown on here are the same things Elizabeth put on her slide. Um, working together, we can more efficiently uh, create uh, new technology, uh, training, strengthen the industry through the, the technology that we bring to it, provide jobs locally, and then ultimate goal is clean maritime transportation. And that's, uh, let's see, I think there's contact information. You can visit our website and download some of these <coughs> reports. Um, and I want to thank the uh, Maritime Administration's Maritime Environmental and Technical Assistance Program for supporting the SF Breeze and Zero V studies as a way to strengthen the U.S. Um, shipbuilding industry and the merchant marine through technology. Thank you very much. So, Lars. Yeah, let me just start off while they're fixing the technical issues. Uh, it's a great mm -hmm. pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank uh, the embassy and also CSIS for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm going to shift the focus a little bit in, uh, in my presentation, where I've talked about hydrogen so far. Um, I will talk more generally about um, our products. What are we bringing to the table in terms of moving towards a low, lower emission and zero emission uh, future? Uh, so how our products are the, the base, uh, basis for that. Um, I represent uh, Brødrenå. It's a long line of syllables pronounced in a very short amount of time, I know. <laughs> so uh, uh, I can stick to the all brothers here because that's what the word means. So it's two brothers founded uh, a company uh, some 70 years ago um, in a small fjord on the western coast of Norway in the county where where uh, Elizabeth ha gave her presentation from. Um, and you would say that to build boats in a small fjord on the western coast, how can you survive? Well, the, the vision of those two uh, founders were that um, 
in order to succeed, you will have to build the best boats in the world. You have to be in the forefront on technology, on innovations and everything. And because if a customer takes to travel to this uh, far out place, um, why, um, why should he do that if he didn't get the best boat available? So here, the two brothers, the, that's the focus from the beginning, uh, and that's what we're, we are sticking to now. Um, I'm not gonna try to sell you any boats here, but I'm talking about our products um, and try to relate them to, to the future uh, we're talking about. So this is the essence of the, the company now. Um, since 2002, we've been building uh, boats in carbon fiber, various, um, uh, various types of boats, monohulls and, and catamarans but they're all built in carbon fiber, and that's what yields sort of the, the um, env environmental effect here, that we build lighter vessels, um, which yields both less fuel consumption and also um, uh, less cost, and uh, of course, uh, less uh, emissions. Not a big company in US terms, but uh, we're one of the, the, the big players on a global scale in terms of uh, high-speed uh, high ferries. This is sort of our main product. Uh, it, to sum up, it's a 40 meter, 130 feet. Uh, make goes at about 30 to 40 knots, depends on the engines. It's a lot of uh, weight being pushed forward on water. So it all comes down to energy. And how do you minimize the, the, the use of energy in, in that term? Well, you have to have a hull which is uh, optimized so this one has a very, uh, how do you say, sharp uh, hull, uh, charges through easily through the water, and it also builds in carbon fiber. This one weighs about 20 to 30 tons <coughs> less than a similar ferry would weigh uh, as an aluminum ferry. So, so you gain a lot of advantage, and that lessens the need for energy to move it forward. So what are we doing in terms of the green shift? Well, the first step is to, this has to, do, has to be done in shifts, just like in the car industry where you move from fossil fuels to hybrids to battery and then to hydrogen. That's what we are trying to do here as well. So we have built this uh, ferry. It's a sightseeing ferry. It's currently under operation in the Sognefjord as a sightseeing boat. Uh, it's a hybrid with a diesel engine and um, uh, battery. It can run on batteries for two, three hours, around 10, 12 knots. Uh, and it operates in an area which is part of the World Heritage, uh, uh, it's on the World Heritage list. So the operator wanted to go clean in that area. So that's why we built it as a, a zero emission ferry, partly, because we, in that area we can shift to batteries and the boat can go uh, without any emission at all. Um, and it's, it has been a great success uh, for the operator. Hybrid, no big, uh, big issue that. It's a battery package, it's a diesel engine, and it's a battery engine, and it's a plug-in hybrid, so we charge it um, on, when it's docked, and also we, um, it can produce um, electricity on board with the diesel engine. Fairly small engine, it's like a big truck engine, 1,000 horsepowers, two of them, each in, uh, one in each hull and a battery package. So that's basically uh, the installments in the, in the inst yeah, installation. Well, the next step. This one is under construction in our yard as we, as we speak. Uh, this is the fully electric version of it. So the battery technology is evolving very fast. So this time around, we are able to put just batteries into the ship. It will operate on the same route, the same uh, area, but now the range is, um, is long enough for us to operate fully electric. Uh, but then comes one challenge. When you go to the dock and you uh, need to charge it, what about the grid? And despite that we are in a region where we produce uh, a lot of electricity, the, the, the grid is not, uh, does not have the capacity mm -hmm. to charge a, a ship like that in a short amount of time. Uh, so in order to leverage that, we have come up with this one, which is a power dock. And it's the same thing as the power pack you have when you're on the go with your phone, uh, but this one is, is for a ship. So uh, this uh, power dock um, will soon go into production and will be delivered with the boat in, in April. 
Um, and this one will sort of take power from the grid um, uh, at a lower rate. <clears throat> and then when the ship docks, it can take, it can fast charge from the power dock and also um, uh, take from the grid at the same time. So that makes it possible to, to charge the boat in 20 minutes. Many of these installations you find onshore, but the new thing here is that we just put it in the water. So it is a power dock. So it, it's um, a product that we are, we are launching now, and, and that makes it possible to, to sort of leverage off the, the, the challenges with the grid in, in terms of uh, deploying electric ferries um, at different places. And it can also charge other things like cars, buses, and, and so forth. And now we're moving on to other concepts, like in the Oslo Harbor Basin, they are looking at going zero in a couple of years. So we have to position ourselves in terms of having concepts that are, that are so as, I, as far as I know now, is the, the cost of operational cost in terms of the cost of hydrogen and also some rules and regulations uh, when it comes to uh, installing um, um, hydrogen on passenger ferries, which is still uh, not solved uh, fully. So that's what we do. I'm going to um, I'm going to give the the, uh, the stage over to Martin, which is our representative in the states, and he's going to go elaborate a little bit more on the carbon and the effects it has on on um, on emissions. I have been and again. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the embassy and CIS. CSIS uh, for allowing us to be here. But anyway, I have been involved with the composites industry starting out in the marine business um, for some over 30 years and have been, had a relationship with Brother Zoe for well over 20 years and been watching their technology. Now, take the state of Maine. It's the oldest shipping building state in the U.S. We've been building ships and vessels for over 400 years. And I've been saying, we need to bring this technology to the U.S., and how do we best do that? Now, with that, uh, we have formed a joint venture company called Arcadia Alliance, which is between Brothers O and their technology that they have developed over all these years. Um, and we've been searching for a long time for the right shipyard in Maine that had the capabilities of building with composites in the sizes and the technologies required. And that was Front Street Shipyard in Belfast, Maine. A very young company, but very, very capable. <clears throat> Here you have a picture from the facility where they're taking up to 500 ton vessels in their travel lift and move them right inside their facility. And this is where we are going to construct carbon fiber ferries based in the relationship with Brothers All in the great state of Maine. Now, you can say, why carbon fiber? And we don't have to go very far in the United States to figure out why. Go and knock on the doors of Boeing Aerospace. They can today not build a competitive aircraft that can compete with Airbus. And Airbus is in the same boat, so to say. They utilize carbon fiber in the constructions of their fuselage, of their wings, in order to take weight out. Um, and not only to take weight out, but also strengthen the aircraft, give it longer longevity. Uh, the fatigue properties of a composite structure is dwarfs that of any metal structure. Um, so why carbon fiber? <clears throat> we can reduce drastically the weight over a traditional vessel. And as Lars has mentioned many a time, uh, what do we provide to the maritime industry, whether it's diesel propulsion, whether it's electric propulsion, whether it's hybrid, or now hydrogen? We give them a head start. We take a ton of weight out of the vessel allowing you to install a lesser weighing uh, propulsion system. What does that mean? That directly also means in reduced fuel cost 
And what does reduced meal, uh, fuel cost mean? It also means a significant reduction in CO2 and uh, NOx. We have some, uh, I have another slide later on where we have an operator that operates today some 80 ferry boats. They have 10 composite vessels built in carbon fiber from Brothers O, and they have 10 equal size, equal capacity, equal, equal speed, uh, and they reduce their maintenance cost by some 50 to 60 percent on the external hull maintenance cost. And what does that mean? That means that these vessels live forever. If you go to the marine industry today, there are vessels out there that are 60 years of age and they're on their third engine, but the hull is as good as it was when it was built in the late 50s or early 60s. And here you have uh, a picture from the yard, but these two ferries belong to Norled, which operates, as I said, uh, 80 vessels. And 10 of those of equal size uh, to the aluminum ones have reduced their maintenance cost drastically. Now, what's it mean to build a vessel in composite? One of the things that traditionally constructing in composite was not the cleanest process in the air. It contains styrene, which is an, an off gas that we don't want to uh, omit into the atmosphere. So what you see here is a newly developed process called vacuum infusion. You lay up all the reinforcing material, all the carbon fiber. Then you seal it with a vacuum bag and you pull vacuum on it and you let it sit on the vacuum for some hours. And once you've had it under vacuum and ensure that you have full vacuum and no air in the laminate, you open the valves to let the resin system in and in a matter of a few hours, you will pull out a 130-foot vessel fully, uh, fully constructed. Um, <clears throat> so it's a quite a revolutionary process in itself, and it's clean. Now back to the comparison between what's it mean to build in aluminum uh, and what's it mean to build in carbon fiber. As you see here, here are two equally sized vessels, uh, same number of passengers, same speed, um, but the engine requirement, this is this being diesel engines, MTUs from Mercedes, is cut in half. And the energy requirements as the engine size is more or less cut in half. That translates in a dollars and cents savings. Here you have upwards to almost a million dollars saved fuel cost per annum. Um, and the fuel savings is drastic. You have up to 40%. And of the two ferries that I showed in the previous slide, those ran for a <clears throat> full year documenting the consumptions and the data from both vessels for over a year. So it's not just a one day comparison. It is for over a year. And again, the CO2 emission translates to the same as the fuel savings emission of 40%. We haven't seen over 40%, but we traditionally see anywhere between 30 to 40%. <clears throat> so as has been said many a time here, and the president of the Red and White Fleet, he keeps saying that you can buy this technology on Amazon, um, but this is not new technology. It is all here today. The carbon fiber construction is all here today. How to do it is all here today. The hydrogen technology is here today. We can do it. Um, this is a quick video of the vision of the fjord. So it's all here today. It's not revolutionary, and we can do it. And we would like to bring this project to the state of Maine. Thank you. Yeah, he's gonna, he's going to continue. Yeah, I was just going to say, well, it's a wrap up, actually. Uh, the choice between the different mm -hmm. propulsion system is, is a matter of the, the, the variables we've listed there. So uh, 
we see this as a step-by-step -step process where we move towards hydrogen, but you have to take these steps in, in, in terms of the cost of everything and, and the development of technology. So um, this is, but what we are bringing to the table, that's a lighter vessel because that's a head start. That's where you have to start. So I'm ju just gonna end with this small video showing the vision of the future. off a trip, but if we are, I'm definitely going to get a ticket because I want to go see those fjords on that boat. So that's actually pretty spectacular. So let me start off because uh, I want to have a couple of discussions first and then I'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, I know that, Martin, you made a comment that it's all here today, but given my experience, there are always areas that aren't exactly ready for prime time or are not necessarily fully scalable. And they may not be technological. So I'd like each of you or whoever feels comfortable commenting on where you see breakthroughs that are necessary, whether they're in the technological area, say in the production or distribution or use of hydrogen, or whether they're in the, the regulatory area or it's a marketing thing or it's a timing. I mean, I really just want to get a good sense as to where we are today and where you see the industry exploding going forward. I have one. I have one comment, and it's not very. Oops. I have one comment, and it's not very scientific, but it goes back to dances with wolves or whatever. Build the first one, and they shall come. For the record, that's Field of Dreams. But. Yeah. <laughs> same, same actor. Same actor. Yeah. 